Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our 2021 Veterans Day ceremony. Please stand at attention. We're about to begin with the raising of the flag. Join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. I now have the invocation by Jerry Weisenauer, Captain of the U.S. Marine Corps. Unless you're in uniform, please remove your covers. Our most gracious and loving God, we stand before you as proud veterans, family, and friends of the armed forces of the United States of America, Canada, and other allied countries. We have served you and our country proudly and faithfully. Today we salute those who have given their lives in defense of our freedoms and in defense of the Constitution of the United States of America. We also salute those who are suffering from wounds, loss of limbs, or disease suffered while serving you and our country. Be with those who are homeless or suffering from PTSD. And Father, please be with the spouses, children, and families of these veterans. Father, we know that your will is our will, and we must focus all our efforts on our eternal life to be spent with you. Most of all today, Father, we ask you to stand and protect those who are serving on active duty in defense of our freedom and our country. Watch over them continually. We ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, for that wonderful invocation. I'm happy you're all here with us today. This is once again an unusual ceremony for us. Uh, we, we moved from here to the River Club. We left the River Club last year because of COVID and ho had hoped to go back. But due to the size of the crowd we knew we would draw, we thought we'd give COVID one more year to get settled here and not have everybody standing, sitting inside so close. So next year we hope to get back to the River Club. In the meantime, we're happy you're all here. We have parts of the program that have been pre-recorded and we'll put them together in a full video which will be released later on this afternoon or first thing tomorrow morning, including all of what you see here today and some wonderful uh, uh, stuff that we've done in the last couple of weeks with Pelican Sound veterans. So now I'd like to introduce our General Manager and Chief Operating Officer, Eric Long, to say a few words. Thank you. To all the veterans here today, I sincerely thank you for your service and your sacrifice. Thank you all for choosing to honor Veterans Day here at Pelican Sound. Um, we're trying to figure out how many years we've gone in celebrating this ceremony. We're around 10 to 15 years that we've done something of this nature. So this, we'll, we'll, today we'll say it's the 15th year that we're celebra celebrating this type of ceremony here at Pelican Sound. And we're truly honored to show our support to our heroes, past and present. I've not served in the military, but like many, have family members that have served. For example, my grandfather Jacob Mills served as a sergeant in the Army Air Corps, 1942 through 1945. He was stationed mostly in Corsica. After the war, throughout the years, he served as 
community and at one point he was a general manager just like me at a country club um, before he passed he taught me the most important traits respect integrity and honor to this day those traits are near and dear to my heart in a way to thank my grandfather for his service and his sacrifice I named my son Jacob in honor of him for years to come on Veterans Day, we honor their service, dedication, and valor, and forever grateful for their sacrifice. Again, thank you for your service, and thank you for serving our country. Thank you, Eric, and thanks for the support of you and your management team in putting this together each year. We're especially thankful for the sound system. <laughs> Each year we show pictures of our Pelican Sound veterans from their service days. This year we have a number of new photos, both from newer arrivals and long-term Pelican Sound residents. Our first of two segments begins now. Pelican Sound resident and Marine Jim Reedy came across a wonderful poem last year on what it means to be a veteran. While the title and the author are unknown, its message is very clear. Our committee felt strongly that we should be included in this year's program. I think you'll enjoy it. We recruited some Pelican Sound veterans to read the poem. We'll begin with Jim Reedy, U.S. Marine Corps. We left home as teenagers for an unknown adventure. We loved our country enough to defend it and protect it with our own lives. We said goodbye to friends and family, 
and everything we knew. We learned the basics and then we scattered in the wind for the corners of the earth. We found new friends and new family. We became brothers and sisters regardless of color, race, or creed. We had plenty of good times and plenty of bad times. We didn't get enough sleep. We smoked and drank too much. We picked up both good and bad habits. We worked hard and played harder. We didn't earn a great wage. We experienced the happiness of mail call and the sadness of missing important events. We didn't know when or even if we would ever see home again. We grew up fast and yet somehow we didn't grow up at all. We fought for our freedoms and for the freedoms of many others. Some of us saw actual combat and some of us didn't. Some of us saw the world and some of us didn't. Some of us dealt with physical welfare. Most of us dealt with psychological welfare. We have seen and experienced and dealt with the things that we can't fully describe or explain as not all of our sacrifices were physical. We participated in time-honored ceremonies and rituals with each other. We strengthened our bonds and camaraderie. We counted on each other to get our job done and sometimes to survive it all. We have dealt with victory and tragedy. We have celebrated and mourned and we've lost a few along the way. When our adventure was over, some of us went back home. Some of us started somewhere new and some of us never came home at all. We had told amazing and hilarious stories of our exploits and adventures. We share an unspoken bond with each other that most people don't experience and few will understand. We speak highly of our own branch of service and poke fun at the other branches. We know, however, that if needed, we will be there for our brothers and sisters and stand together as one in a heartbeat. Being a veteran is something that had to be earned and it can never be taken away. It has no monetary value, but at the same time, it is a priceless gift. People see a veteran and they thank us for our service. When we see each other, we give a little upwards nod or a slight smile, knowing that we have shared and experienced things that most people have not. So from all of us to the rest of the veterans out there, we commend and thank you for all that you've done and sacrificed for your country. Try to remember the good times and forget the bad times. Share your stories. But most importantly, stand tall and proud, for you have earned the right to be called a veteran. Now we're going to have the service branch muster call. We're going to start with the Army. Sir, U.S. Army personnel, President Nicole. Sir. United States Air Force. Air Force. All present or accounted for, sir. Department of the Navy. United States Navy, all present or accounted for, sir. U.S. Marine Corps. Sir. U.S. Marines, all present or accounted for, sir. United States Coast Guard. United States Coast Guard, all present or accounted for, sir. And we thank our Canadian allies and anyone else who served in the military, Merchant Marine, and otherwise, we're so happy to have you all here today.
several years, our ceremony has included a veterans discussion. We've had people like Admiral Jerry Johnson, a former Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Art Stonebreaker, a Navy vet whose LST made repeated landings on the beach on D-Day. And last year, Ted Robbins talked about the World War II experiences of his father and the impact on Ted and his sister. This year, we're pleased to have three Pelican Sound veterans to talk about their military experiences. Barb Schultz will lead the discussion. Barb is not a veteran, but she worked for 22 years for the Department of the Navy, and she knows a thing or two about the military. So I'm very pleased to turn it over to Barb for our veterans discussion. Hi, welcome. I'm Barb Schultz, and today we have three veterans who joined the military and served our country and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves and talk about uh, how long they were in the military and perhaps uh, what prompted them to join. So I will start with you, Joanne. Okay, my name is Joanne Blumenthal and uh, I'm the oldest of four children and my father was looking for a way to um, make it financially easier on him. So at the University of Vermont, uh, I joined the uh, Berry Plan, which was, they paid for my two years of my education, you know, room and board and tuition, and then I owed them three years working in a military hospital. So that's what I did. So you were a nurse? I am a nurse, <coughs> and I was in the 67, 68, 69, during the Vietnam era. So it was a very chaotic time, very challenging time. So um, I'll, I'll just pass it on to you girls, sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Claire Toll, and uh, I joined uh, as an enlisted person in the U.S. Army with my best friend Cheryl, who we'll meet in a minute. Uh, we served for, I served for two years. We went in in 1985. Um, we were in the Signal Corps and uh, worked in the training and communications. And I'm Cheryl, her friend, and we joined the Army together, as she said, in 1985, um, right out of high school. And I ended up serving 20 years, and I retired in 2004. And eventually I transferred from the Signal Corps to um, the admin side of things and I worked um, at, at the brigade level and um, I transferred to the Army Reserves and worked at the highest headquarters there um, when I retired from there. So, but I, yeah, so <coughs> we were on the, what was called the buddy system. Mm -hmm. That's neat. I'm really curious as to what branch of the service were you in and what kinds of things you did. For myself, I had many different types of jobs in, in many different types of units. I was in a, um, a maintenance unit, I was in a school unit, I was in a hospital unit. Um, I had jobs where we did humanitarian missions in Guatemala, which was probably my favorite time of my career. Um, and then I was at the Army Reserve Headquarters in charge of the training division, and my job was to send all the soldiers to the individual training classes. Um, like airborne school or nursing school or, and such. And then at, my, at the end of my career, sadly, I did not deploy, but I was deploying people. And, and I have a lot of guilt with that. So, yeah. How about you? Uh, well, after uh, Cheryl and I finished basic training and our AIT school, I went to Germany. And when I arrived in Germany, my entire battalion was out serving in the field. Um, so I was pretty lucky in the fact that when I arrived, they said, well, do you know how to type? And I did not know how to type. I said, I absolutely do know how to type. <laughs> and so the battalion commander's secretary was a civilian employee who was going back to the States. And so I served as the battalion commander's secretary for the remainder of my time. So. And were you in Germany the whole time? I was. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> So I feel pretty lucky. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. How about you, Jimmy? Well, I felt lucky too because a lot of my um, classmates went to Vietnam. Um, 
And I went to Japan, and I worked at a, a thousand bed hospital. And the hospital was interesting because it was leftover Quonset huts from the Korean War. So it was like a village if you wanted to get. Mm -hmm. If you needed blood, you had to get in your car and drive down to the lab. So that's how it was just really sprawled out. Um, and I worked on a unit that was, um, it was a closed unit. We had to wear scrubs. It was all infected wounds. Mm -hmm. All our patients were from Vietnam. And they were too sick to go back to the States. So um, we took care of them there. A thousand bed hospital was, unfortunately, was full to capacity. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, so were you in Japan the whole time? No, I, the first year I was in uh, Fort Hood, Texas. And I worked on a woman's ward. And in the military, they segregate you. So the women's ward had everything from bed surge to neuro, ortho. So that was interesting also. I had come from Vermont, and I was in Texas. <laughs> and I thought I was in a different country. <laughs> so that was an experience. I'll get it wrong. And I met my husband there at Fort Hood. And we were going to get married there. But I got orders for Japan, and then he got orders for Korea. So we ended up getting married in Japan. So. Little known secret, she outranked him. I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was curious if you had the same training, basic training that I did. What, did, what was your... Wait, so we, did you go in as enlisted? No, I went in as, as a lieutenant, then I made captain. So you probably, yeah, you did officer basic training. Yeah. Um, which is, is definitely different. But we, we were out in the field, oh. you know, we had to learn how to shoot a gun, and yes. oh. gas mask, yes, and mass. the whole nine oh, yards. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> same. Same. <laughs> how to pitch Rock a tent. Marches, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some tents, so, yeah. Memorize your social security number. Oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. And everybody, well, yeah. I, I know a few of them now. <laughs> My ex-husband. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I was in Korea as well. Oh, so when, okay. when Claire got, so we were in this buddy system, and she, um, in, when we were in Georgia, she got married and we got to go to Germany, so that broke our contract, which was supposed to keep us together and keep us in the United States. So she went off to Germany, and I was told I was going to go to Hawaii, and then when my actual orders came in, it said, Seoul, Korea, and I <laughs> cried, and cri I, I could just picture the rice paddies and the swamps, <laughs> and, and I'd call my mom, and she's like, it's going to be great, it's going to be such a great experience, and then she'd hang up, and she would cry, <laughs> but it ended up being a wonderful experience. How uh, long were you there? I was there a year and a half, okay. and um, I got married over there, and um, just going out into the different villages that, where they don't speak English, and trying to you know, learn the, the language and communicate with, with um, the Korean people. I even got offered to marry a Korean soldier or a Korean man to keep him from having to go into the Korean army. They wanted to offer me $10,000 and I had oh. stayed married to him for two years and I was like, well, he's, he's too short. <laughs> <laughs> $10,000 in what year? 1986. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was tempting, but... I was like, I took a little for those two years. Yeah. In the, in the, when my husband was there in the 60s, it was still very primitive. Yes. No, it's no, cha South it's Korea changed a lot. It has so. changed a lot. In fact, we have a, a Facebook group of all the people that had been stationed at Camp Colburn, which is where the signal battalion was. And just the comments and the pictures through the years. And now that base isn't even there. It's just a big mountain. You know, everything had been removed. but. Someone just recently went back to Seoul, Korea and did a video of the city and it's like just so modern and clean and, you know, I was there when they were building the Olympic Stadium, so we used to go by all of that and watch it, you know, be built um, when we went into Seoul and back, but, so it's, but it's changed so much, it's interesting. So, um, and this time I'll start with Claire, um, is there anything in your service career life that you've been able to then take with you and use into your civilian life? Um, I, I think, you know, I, I was so young when I went into the service, we were right out of high school, 
and I think just the the um, discipline and the regiment and learning, you know, really to respect the chain of command and to follow the rules and follow procedure. And I pretty much still operate that way to this day. And what do you do now? I'm an accountant. Okay. Great. How about you, Joanne? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I, I got to really appreciate the corpsman, the people underneath me, you know, below rank-wise, were really the, the whole nub of the operation. Mm -hmm. The corpsman worked so hard, and <clears throat> it makes me today even appreciate how hard some of these people work, you know, laborers and mm -hmm. So it's uh, they were they were my heroes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they did all the, the grunt work, hard work. So and it was politically, it was um, such a crazy time because there was anti-war marches and there were all kinds of um, race riots and. <clears throat> When we first went over to Japan, the people just loved us. They wanted us, they gave us gifts if they could practice their English with us. Mm -hmm. And by the second year, they wanted us out of there because basically we're staging the whole war from Japan. There are numerous Air Force bases, Naval bases, Army hospitals. Um, and so then we became very discriminated against. And that was a whole new experience. That, so. Wow. How about you, Sheila? Um, I agree with a lot with what Claire said, the discipline, the, the regiment. Um, you know, I learned to be a hard worker. I, I think because we went in so young, and then after coming back, we realized how much we had grown and matured over our friends that were still living at home and still doing the same things every day. And we've traveled and we've, we've shot guns and we you know, just have learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the biggest thing I got out of being in the military was the humanitarian mission that I did. We went to Guatemala, we had two weeks of training every year. So every two weeks there would be new groups rotating in and they were there to improve the roads, mm -hmm. build some schools and build some hospitals. And I, I got to go down and be a part of it, and I just learned just the, the poverty and that I saw and how this road made such a difference because the village on the other side of the mountain, these people had to walk up and over this and bring their animals to sell them in the village down where they could make money or get groceries, and, and it just changed their lives. But my favorite part was visiting one of the schools that was being upgraded. Um, it basically was a dirt floor with window openings, no windows. They had some benches and a chalkboard, but they had no supplies. So we got to bring them all the supplies they needed, because the kids would still go every day. Some didn't have shoes, and some didn't, you know, and the teacher had nothing to teach with, so they would just play outside and sing and do different things, and we got to bring them everything they needed to run as a school. And so after seeing all that, I had come back, and that's when I started to learn to give back, even there were times when I was a single parent and I needed, but I always gave, you know, and so I came back and I started a collection and I had food, uh, excuse me, um, clothing, school supplies, shoes, everything donated, and I would have them put on the plane for every next rotation so they could go out and spread, um, spread the joy to the other kids there. So and ever since then, I volunteer whenever I can and, and help, and, and that is really special to me. And what, and what are you doing now? You're still working too. Right? No, I, I was when I first moved here. I was working okay. full time, and then I got laid off, and then I broke my leg, and then COVID hit, and so um, I'm just enjoying life right now here. You know, I'll probably eventually try to get a job, or I, I just signed up for some more volunteering here. So um, I stay busy. Right. Yeah. Now, hearing all of that, which is I'm just in awe of it. Would you all do it again? I certainly would. Yeah. For the adventure of it all, the new experiences, the travel, like you girls are saying. <coughs> yeah. I learned to work with different, a variety of different people. 
yeah, it was it was a grand experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my time in the service was short. I was only in for two years, but it was a great experience. I grew, I matured, and I feel like it kind of gave me what I needed to be successful in life. I agree, I would do it again too. I don't know that I would ever have done it if I didn't do it with Claire, mm -hmm. but you know, I give people a lot of credit that just went and did it on their own, but you know, once we got in, you know, we weren't always together. So, um, you know, we grew separately and then and we stayed friends for many years. And, and what year was this? 1985. I didn't even know there was a buddy program. The Army was the only one that offered it. Yeah. So when we had decided, we met for lunch one day because she had started college and I didn't go to college. I was not a good student. I was intimidated. And she wasn't happy. So we met for lunch one day and we're like, let's do something. Let's just do something. Like, let's travel. You know, like, how are we going to do that? We'll go in the military. So we s took the time and met with each of the branches of the service. And the Army was the only one that not only offered the buddy system, but offered a two-year contract versus a four-year. So we felt like if we didn't like it, we only had to do two years. So that's how that That's great. Yeah. What would you say to someone else now graduating from high school? If they sort of didn't know what they wanted to do, would you recommend it to them? You know, I do, um, especially if they're not somebody that feels like they should go to college. I didn't give my children an option. As soon as I had my children, it was never, it was, you know, elementary school, middle school, high school, college. There was no options, you know, because I didn't really want them to go. And that's because when I got out, that's when 9-11 happened, and, you know, all this deployment. And I didn't everything. want them to go into the right. military. Right. But, you know, I've met different, ch different people along the way that have asked me. And I think even if you just do a few years, like we learned, you know, just the growing up and maturity and, and discipline, um, it will take you a long way in life. And um, so I, I think I would. I get hesitant sometimes when you know when you hear everything in the news that's going on and how difficult it is and how you know I people don't come home or they come back severely injured, um, you know, physically or mentally, and that's tough because I, I go to the VA a lot and I have a, a dog that's a therapy dog and I would take him to the VA to visit hospice patients and dementia patients, but just seeing the young soldiers or recently released soldiers coming in and how, just how um, mentally or physically they, they need so much help. So I, that's where I get torn, you know, because it can be a great career. I know people that have done it for 30, 40 years and have been, you know, extremely successful, excuse me. So. Yeah, and you know, um, when I was in Germany, that was during the time that Gaddafi was bombing the U.S. bases. But compare, and so that was scary, and they were checking our vehicles every time we were going on and off base. Um, but compared to some of the wartime deployments that people are experiencing now, I feel like it's a very different world than what we went into when we were in the Army. You know, and sometimes I do joke and, and say it was kind of like the Private Benjamin Army. Um, I mean, we, we served our, our time, um, but we we had a lot of fun doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. and you know, we, we had each other. We yeah. did too. Uh, we worked hard. We worked twelve-hour shifts, but <coughs> um, we had tennis courts and a swimming pool, and we did not suffer. Uh, mm -hmm. We had great food. Uh, we traveled on weekends or whenever we had days off. And, so, in spite of the hard work, there were a lot of perks. So. Yeah, and I don't miss the days of being in Korea on the top of a mountain in the middle of the winter, sleeping in a tent for 30 days at a time, and not showering and all that. But then I go to Guatemala and have a completely different experience. Yeah. So, yeah. now you take the good with the bad. So you were in Guatemala, Korea, those are the two main? Panama, Panama. and then the United States. It's interesting that we're all in different countries. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Germany was considered a top place to go. Yeah. Yep. I had a great experience. Um, I was in a little village right outside of Stuttgart called Ludwigsburg. Uh, and I remember being young and relatively naive. And during one of my first days off, a girlfriend of mine and we left the, the base and took a bus into Stuttgart really not thinking about 
how do we get back? Which bus do we take back? <laughs> you know, I mean, this, so sometimes I think back to those days and I think, oh, I was so naive. Yeah, you know, yeah. but we, we all were. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we were. Yeah. So other than Cheryl, neither of you had to sleep in a tent or do any of that kind of stuff. No, I had lovely yeah. bachelor quarters. I did many times. Yeah. Did I you? was on a, in Korea, I was on a quick reaction force team and there were only two females and we had to go out into the woods for 10 days, and we had to, I had to carry the um, um, machine gun and go around, and then we did this almost like a laser tag type of thing, but so we all had teams, and then as the teams, we had to disperse, and we had to shoot at the other people on the opposite teams, and they had to have the vests, almost like laser tag, and we had to get down, and just say this was a big rice paddy, we had to get to this point, and the only way to get there was to low crawl with your weapon. And I was the first one back out of everybody, and I was so proud of that one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, so we, you know, we were out in those woods, you know, bathing in a river and eating MREs, and yeah, it was, that was yeah. quite an experience. Yeah. Yeah, I was very proud of that moment. <laughs> and we were different eras for wars, too. Right. right. Mm -hmm. No, we didn't have pools. Yeah. <laughs> I think we had a pool either, but I didn't have to sleep in a tent. So, <laughs> so this is going to be a question about way before. What did your parents think of this after you two had lunch? And you went home and you said, hey, Mom and Dad. Yeah. Oh, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. <laughs> no, they weren't it was pretty. Not pretty. <laughs> Both of my parents had gone to college and fully expected that that was exactly what all myself and my siblings would be doing. So they were quite shocked. My parents were not happy. Neither of them went to college, but so they weren't expecting that. But um, they definitely were not expecting us to go into the military. And my dad was in the reserves, um, and I, my dad's dad and my grandfather was a retired lieutenant colonel. So it was in the family, and not as you know, forty-something family member that the only one that ended up in the military. But at the moment when I told them, it was not pretty. They were fighting and they were blaming each other. She wants to leave because of you. No, she wants to leave because of you. <laughs> I'm like, no, I just want to leave and have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then what? So 20, was, did you say 20 years later? Yes. Yeah. 20 years later, I came back and okay, fun's over. Now I'm going to start new fun. <laughs> so now your dad was happy that you found a way to pay for college. What did they think when you got transferred over to, I guess, when you went to Texas and then to Japan? Um, I think they were excited. Yeah. Yeah, they were pretty supportive. They came, actually came over for the wedding. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Kurt's side of the family was not supportive of yes. us. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, my parents were pretty. I think they were happy. Good, great. Well, thank you very, very much. This has been really illuminating. I hope it's illuminating to everyone who watches. Thank you, Joanne, Cheryl, and Claire, for that wonderful conversation. And thanks to you for leading the conversation, Barb. Veterans are such an important part of the Pelican Sound community, whom we honor today. And this year, we also want to honor residents whose children or grandchildren serve in the armed forces. So thanks for sending in these photos for all of us to enjoy. <laughs> We're going to have the remembrance of our deceased veterans. Each year we honor the memory of Pelican Sound veterans 
lost since our last ceremony. Let us reflect on and honor the service of Frank Goley. Frank was an infantry officer in Vietnam and was awarded the Bronze Star. Jerry Plummer. Jerry proudly served his country as a member of the National Guard. In addition, on the 20th anniversary of 9-11, we want to remember and salute the brave men and women who died that day. In this vein, we have added the Tunnel to Towers Foundation as a charity worthy of your consideration. Tunnel to Towers is almost an unheard of five star, 98 out of 100 rating of, from distinguished independent charity navigator organization. Again, we would like to honor all first responders, military personnel, and their families who made tremendous sacrifices in the 20 years that have followed 9-11. Thank you all for joining us today. Be sure to watch the full video coming out uh, later. Companies are dismissed.